This morning we're going to start a message, and we're not going to touch on every single thing that there is to be preached on in the book of Philippians, but over the next several weeks we're going to take a journey through the book of Philippians. I, at least once a year I like to take a series through a book of the Bible, and uh, so I feel, I feel like we're to do that right now. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to be obviously in the book of Philippians. We're going to start in the first chapter. And the first verse, and if you'd stand with me uh, for the reading of the Word, Philippians chapter 1, we will read verses 1 through 6. Again, that's Philippians 1, 1 through 6. It says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And verse 6 is where I'm going to focus today. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If you want a title for the message, it's He Finishes What He Starts. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the promises of Your Word. I pray that You would speak to us today through Your Word and that we would receive everything from it that You would have for us to grab. And let our hearts be good soil to receive it so that we go on from this place and produce godly fruit with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you aren't already, God bless you. You may be seated. So we're going to take this from a couple of different angles in verse 6. And the first one we're going to look at is He fulfills His promises. How many of you know that God, when He makes a promise, you can count on it? How many of you know that? You know that you know that you know when God makes a promise, you can take that check to the bank and cash it. Because He is going to fulfill what He promises. There are so many different examples in Scripture that we could dig into, and that in and of itself would be an entire sermon series. But this morning I wanted to take a moment, at least for this particular point, and focus on the story and example of Abraham. And when you look at Abraham's example, God had given him the promise of a son multiple times. He had said, your offspring uh, are going to be a blessing. There are going to be so uh, many of them that you wouldn't even be able to count them. They'll be like the stars. Your descendants will be uh, as numerous as the stars. God had given Abraham a promise that, hey, you're going to have a son. Now, I'm not going to focus on where he tried to rush that promise, and we, many of us here would know that story where he and Sarah get a little impatient, and from that we have Ishmael. No, we're talking about the son of the promise. We're talking about Isaac. And, and when you jump into this story, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 18 and verses 9 through 14. Remember, the, the promise that's been given to Abraham is, you will have a son. You will have descendant. You will have an heir, someone who will carry on the family name and tradition, so to speak. When well, Genesis 18, starting in verse 9, it says, They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, listen, this is important to remember, verse 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So they are, in a physical sense, they are very much past the age of childbearing. How many of you are with me on that? God's given the promise you're going to have a son. Their physical bodies say, "Uh uh-uh, no you're not, because we can't do that anymore. Verse 12 says, So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have the pleasure? You're not going to find that on any sort of a birthday card, are you? Seriously? I mean, in other words, Sarah's saying, for real? Like, do you, are you honestly saying that in my old age, and especially in the old age of my husband, that we're going to have a baby now? Are you kidding me? And then it says, The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything, verse 14, hang on to these words, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. 
and Sarah shall have a son. So in verse 14, the Lord repeats the promise that was given in verse 10. Verse 10, it was, hey, I'm going to be back this time about this time next year. You're going to have a son. Sarah hears it and goes, yeah, right. No way. And the Lord says, is anything too hard for me? I told you. Did you not hear what I said? I told you. Is anything too hard for me? No, I told you about a year from now I'm going to come back and she's going to have a baby boy. Abraham didn't believe it. Sarah definitely didn't believe it. But verse 14 again, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for Him? In Genesis 21, the first three verses, it says, The Lord visited Sarah as He had said. Let's pause there for a minute. And the Lord did to Sarah as He had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac. And I know I've mentioned this in previous messages before, but I, I, the, it's not an ironic or coincidental thing that his name was Isaac. The name Isaac means he laughs. And so I want you to think about that for a moment. Remember how Sarah responded when the Lord gave the promise in Genesis 18. She hears the Lord say, you're going to have a son. And she goes, (laughs) yeah, right. Uh, Yeah, right. No, I'm not. You seen how old I am, God? I'm ancient. And if I'm ancient, you should see my husband. He's older than me. Are you kidding me? So then this baby comes and they name him. He laughs. I want you to just think about it. Isaac's name was a lasting testimony to how crazy his birth was in the natural. Every time they called out, even when he was in trouble, and you know how it is. I don't know what it was like in in those Hebrew days, but here you get the middle name, you know. Aaron David, you know, that was, I heard that a lot as a kid. I don't know about you. I don't know if that's a northern Indiana thing, but it's definitely a southern Indiana thing. I can't tell you how many times my middle name was thrown into, I'm in trouble. But even in those moments where maybe Abraham and Sarah were getting on to Isaac, he said, Isaac! They're declaring a name that was a testimony of how crazy his birth even was in the first place. Every time they uttered His name, think about that. Every time they uttered His name, it was a reminder that God fulfilled His promise. Isn't that powerful to know that that's the kind of God we serve? Some of you all need to be receiving this today. I'm telling you, the Lord's given some of you promises that you haven't seen come to pass yet. And you're going to see them come to pass. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says it this way, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly, that means way beyond, extraordinary, uncommon, or remarkably above anything that we could ask or think according to the power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Listen, He can do way more than you can even think of. You might have a... I don't care how big your box is, it's still not big enough. Can I say that again? I don't care how big your box is that you try to shove God in, it's still not big enough. Isn't that awesome? To know that He's not limited by your expectations. To know that He's not limited by your worries and your doubts. That He's not limited by your physical condition or your mental state. That He's not limited by anything. He can go far above anything you could ask or even imagine. Friends, I'm going to say it this way. What God has promised might look like it's dried up and hopeless, and it might seem impossible, but I'm here to tell you this morning that God's promises always come to pass. Every single one of them. In Scripture, if you look in the, in the book of Joshua, this isn't going to be on the screen, but if you start to look towards the end of the book of Joshua, after all of their conquests and how they had overcome all their enemies and they're inheriting the promised land, here's what you find. Toward the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua makes a statement similar to this. I'm paraphrasing, but he says, Not one of God's promises failed. Every single thing that God promised came to pass. And He's the same yesterday, today, Hebrews tells us that, and 
forever. Somebody help me today. He doesn't lie. He's not a man that He should lie. He's going to make a way where there doesn't seem to be one. Amen? Amen. Now, how many of you know that we should also look at Scripture? You're kind of getting two sermons in one this morning. That was your felt need part of the message. Now we're going to look at the context of what we read to begin with. Because all of these things are true, but we should also stay true to the text. In Philippians 1... 1 through 6, the main point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make, which is my second point of today's message, is that he fulfills his eternal promise. What Paul's talking about here is he's saying, the good work of sanctification that God has started in your life has begun, and at the day of Jesus Christ, When this is all said and done, it'll be brought to completion. Now, I know some of this is going to seem like Christianity 101, but how many of you know we need to know the basics too? We know the good work of this sanctification starts at our salvation. At 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Right? The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that... That you may not be perfect, but you're more like Jesus today than what you were when you first surrendered your life to Him. Are you grateful for that? I know it's Christianity 101, but the old me is gone and I'm made new in Jesus. I belong to Him and I have an inheritance with Him forever. How many of you know that that process of sanctification, you are set free from your sins the moment that you have surrendered your life to Jesus? How many of you know that? Right? You're saved by grace through faith. It's not the result of your works. You can't brag about it. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You can't brag about your salvation. It's it's a free gift of grace given to you by God. All you do is receive in faith. With me so far? But how many of you know that salvation is a starting line? It's not a finisher. You know, when you surrender your life to the Lord, there's a process that takes place, and that's what we call sanctification. God continually working in your life. Let's look at it in 2 Corinthians 3 from the New Living Translation. I'm going to read in verses 16 through 18. Let's listen to what that says. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is a Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. That last line, we are made more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Friends, that's a process. It's a process. We're made new in Him and He makes us more like Him with every day that we live. How many of you also know that We bear some responsibility in this process too. Now, for anybody that's kind of getting a little worked up and you might be saying, well, here comes that works-based message. No, I just told you we're saved by grace through faith. I'm not. What I'm trying to say is this. The only way we can handle our own responsibility is through how we present ourselves. Our responsibility is in the presentation. How do we present ourselves and to whom do we present ourselves? It's your position and what you're surrendered to, who you are surrendered to. Romans 6, 13, and then in verse 19 says it this way. Do not present. That word present means to place beside or near. So don't put yourself near your members. Don't put them near to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. In verse 19, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. 
Let me build on this a little bit. In Romans 12 and verse 1, it says it this way, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present the same definition, same word. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let's break this down a little bit here today. I'm not talking about be good, don't sin. What I'm saying is the way you position yourself will determine if you will be good and stay away from sin. We get that backwards. We make it about effort and striving. And yes, we should strive. Hebrews tells us that strive for holiness without which no one can see God, right? But I'm not talking about be good and God will love you. I'm saying God loves you and He'll make you good. And so it starts with your position and how you present yourselves. Paul in Romans 6, what he's saying is, don't present yourself and your, your members. He's saying, don't present your body in a, in a place or in a way that will set yourself up to sin. We sin because we position ourselves to sin. What do I mean by that? You know, that thought, that glancing thought that comes into your mind, that temptation... How you respond and how you present yourself to that temptation will determine whether or not you partake in it. Is anybody awake today? Are we listening this way? I just I want us to understand this. It's all about the position of your heart and relationship with God. Because I'm telling you right now, the closer you are to Him, the less you want those other things. And yeah, you're going to still want those other things because we are in the process of sanctification. Temptation is still going to knock at the door of your heart. We understand that. What I'm trying to to push this morning is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying in this passage in Romans. He's saying, don't present yourself as a slave to impurity. Present yourself as a slave to righteousness, which leads to sanctification. In other words, I'm going to position my heart In what is said in Romans 12, I'm going to position and present my body as a living sacrifice to God. I'm putting my heart, my life, every part of me on the altar before the Lord and saying, here is my life, I give it all to you. And I'm telling you, if you leave your life in His hands, He will shape you the way that you need to be shaped. And there are so many of us that when the process doesn't go the way we want it to, or it's going a little slower than we would like. How many of you can relate to that? Lord, can you just hurry it up? How many of you have ever felt like that before? How many of you know He knows the right pace? And His pace most of the time is not the one we would prefer. So the question isn't be good or be bad or, 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 or how, how are we going to do all these. It's not about your effort or your works. It's about the position of your heart. So if we're supposed to present ourselves to Him, the question then becomes, are we doing that? In your everyday life, do you present yourself to Him? What I'm talking about is abiding in Him. Resting in Him. Relationship in and with Him. John 15 says it this way. Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, listen to that. You can't just do it on your own. Your Christian works are not going to be really even Christian if you're trying to do it apart from abiding in Him. Are you with me? As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him... He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So I've said it a few different ways already, and I'll I'll say it again. The question isn't whether you're working hard enough or trying to be good enough. The question is, are you abiding in Him? 
And if you're not, the invitation is going to be given here in just a little bit for you to do that. If you are, then there's a one more piece of this that I want to focus on from our main passage in Philippians. Some of you say, this is a Philippians here. You haven't hardly even mentioned it. <laughs> Philippians 1 verse 6, the first words, and they're underlined on the screen for you so you can't miss it. Paul says, and I'm sure of this. I am sure of this. I'm confident of this. I'm persuaded of this. In other words, Paul's saying, I know this beyond the shadow of a doubt. I have no doubt whatsoever that God, who started a good work in you, is going to bring it to completion. And I believe in the same way that Paul said that to the Philippians, I can say it to our church and to all of you today. I'm sure of it. I'm confident. I have no doubt in saying that whatever promises God has given to you, He's going to bring them to pass. And even more important than that, the best promise of all, your salvation, the salvation of your soul, the process of sanctification. I have no doubt whatsoever that what He has started in your life, He will bring it to completion and we'll get to be with Him for all eternity. And friends, that in and of itself is reason enough to praise the Lord. Amen?